So, wow, 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 and double wow. Welcome to what is the eighth creative corner. And I can't believe that it's the eighth creative corner and there's so many people. For you that don't know me, my name's Simon Brown, and I'm the founder of uh, a design studio called And And And. Back in April, we started Creative Corner. It was born from our belief that sharing is essential and that sharing inspiration is fundamental to the creative industry and being creative. So that's what we're all here to do. We've grown quite quickly from being in our studio with five people. There's a hell of a lot here, more than that here tonight. Um, and we've gone on to uh, populate secret venues. So the first off was uh, Campus London, a Google space. We then went to the dock at Tobacco Dock. And we've brought you talks like the provocative Facebook has killed your designer by the inspiration of points. We've brought you brands in the age of reduction in our studio. But what people might not know is that we have it all online in a live kind of archive of all the work. So if you want to be inspired, go online. There'll be an uncut version of tonight up there. So we've also introduced a couple of things that are quite new. We've got live illustration tonight. We've got the wonderful Tilly drawing live for us, which is absolutely f fabulous. We've brought goodie bags to life with lots of partners, and there's a great free gift, gift tonight uh, for the bar. If you uh, download the app, then you get a discount at the bar, so that sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, but most importantly, it's down to everyone in this audience and everyone that's been along to Creative Corner, because for us, You've brought to life disruptive inspiration for inquisitive minds. So, from me and from all of the team, thank you very much. So, I'm actually going to hand over to our guest compare tonight, who is the absolutely wonderful Isabel Timms. So, Isabel, where are you at? Hi, I'm next door. I, uh, I feel a bit like Challenge Annika this evening. Um, welcome to everyone in this room. Um, what's, your, uh, what's your name? My name's Melissa. Melissa, welcome. Have you ever been to a Creative Corner before? No, this is my first. Woo! Okay, welcome. <laughs> Melissa, what do you do? I'm a senior graphic designer. Wonderful. A nice practitioner in the room. Hi. Um, what's your name? Joe. Joe, nice, nice to meet you. you. Uh, what do you do? Uh, designer. Fabulous. Have you ever been to a Creative Corner before? No, no. That was my first time. Excellent. Welcome. Welcome to everyone in this room. I know that's a bit nerve wracking, but thank you. That's brilliant. So, uh, well, can I just hop next door? Oh, it really is not challenge, Annika. So, I forgot to mention a couple of things. This is our first time that we're live streaming on Periscope from what is the cultural hub that is the proud archivist. So this is the first one. We'll publish these online, so if you feel free. The other thing is that there is a Wi-Fi code. It is free. TPN restaurants, look it up. If you've got any questions, use the hashtag Creative Corner. And the most important thing is at and 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 LTD. And the most inspirational, at Lyle Marcus. So thank you very much. Um, right, I don't know about you guys, I'm really, really looking forward to this evening, Fabius Marcus Lau. When you try and think about describing his work, I think it's fair to say it's quite difficult to, uh, to describe. Um, on his website, he describes himself as a um, director and a designer of moving images and live uh, experiences, which I think is a pretty fair analysis of some of the work that he's done. Think giant robots at the Chemical Brothers. Think laser shows and moving coffins at Metallica. Um, I think most recently, I know that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, most recently, um, a collaboration that he uh, worked on called On Your Wavelength. This basically meant that your mind controlled sound and lights. That literally blew my mind. So can we have a massive, <laughs> massive uh, creative corner welcome, please, to Marcus Lyle. Oh, thank you, everyone, for turning up. I hope I can live up to the hype. 
So thank you, Simon, for, uh, for putting me on. It's, uh, so um, we started talking about doing this talk. So I'm going to sit, I'm afraid, because I've got that dodgy back. Um, but Simon and I started talking about doing this talk and trying to figure out what was it that I could talk about that you guys didn't already know about. And hopefully some of this, uh, really what I'm going to share with you is um, not necessarily all things that you'll see in the work, but maybe some things that I think I've picked up along the way from doing various projects. Um, so um, I guess um, probably some of you have had a look at the website and uh, seen what I do. It's, it's a bit of a strange mixture, really. I started off doing graphic design um, at St. Martin's as a course, um, but I got kind of sucked into doing visual shows um, for, basically, for raves in the 90s. And um, <laughs> sort of, that was a bit more fun. And, um, and rather than sort of growing up and doing something a bit more sensible, I seem to have kept doing it. And um, so I seem to have got embroiled in a whole lot of quite strange projects, um, really quite fun stuff. And so now I guess what I do is, um, use a slide here, I do a mixture of um, creative direction, um, film direction, um, production design, and also I do art projects as well. So, and what I'm trying to do at the moment is really try and balance the two things. So doing some art projects and some commercial work and sort of trying to get the two to play together. Um, so um, I'm just going to forward here a bit. Um, so the first thing, this was the first point that sort of came up, was um, it's not what you put into it, it's what the audience get out of it. And um, I've done some work in the past for Bon Jovi. Um, <laughs> now, um, Bon Jovi is um, it's a really interesting job. Basically, what I was asked to do is to do the visuals. So um, all the video content that sits on the LED screens behind the band when they play. And um, yeah, um, say what you like about the music. Um, he is a fantastic showman. He's one of these people who can literally go into a room um, and basically bring it to life. People absolutely love him. Um, and um, for one of the shows that we did, this is a still from the show, um, he had a new song which was called um, When We Were Beautiful, and he had a kind of vision for it, which was um, that he wanted to have a clock tower um, with the hands going backwards, and um, we were inside the clock tower, and then we'd see these hands going back and there'd be this time-lapse shot of New York and we would sort of go through the hands of the clock and then we'd be out in, in Manhattan and it was, you know, this was the sort of, uh, this is what the song was all about and we were like, this was sort of all done by email but back in the studio going, yeah, okay, that's going to be really, really expensive but <laughs> that's fine, we're adding Mark up, let's, let's do it. So... We did this piece, and um, this was one of maybe um, ten pieces that we made for, uh, for that tour. And it took a long time. We had a, a, a motion control shoot where we, um, we uh, built a scale model of um, a clock tower, and we did, had a big sort of, so we had a film studio. Um, we did this sort of 12-hour sort of time-lapse um, shoot to get the camera to move through the, the clock face and all the rest of it. Um, we also had another crew in New York and uh, they spent uh, four nights um, in a hotel room in Manhattan filming this amazing shot of the, uh, the Manhattan skyline. And uh, we um, did a whole bunch of post-production. We put it on as part of, um, part of the show and, um, and it looked pretty good, actually. Um, and then the next song came on and um, they did a close-up of John Bon Jovi's bum. <coughs> and that got a bigger audience reaction.
than all the work that we had slaved on <laughs> for months and months and months. And um, so going back to my previous slide, <laughs> that's the thing about live shows, is that it really, you can spend as much time as you like doing these things, but it's all about how the audience reacts to it. And, um, and it was a, you know, it was a particularly complicated concept and kind of we did it because it's what he wanted, you know, and it looked nice, but not as good as John Bon Jovi's ass. <laughs> Um, which leads me to the next point. How it feels is more important than how it looks. Um, and um, I came across this video the other day. You guys might have, I, I, I don't know, might have already seen this. I'm just going to show you a still. Um, so this video is um, about somebody unboxing Play-Doh. Um, and um, it really is 53 minutes long. <laughs> and um, I'm going to blow up the figure I want you to look at, which is that one. <laughs> and so I think this has got some really sort of profound um, <laughs> issues for any of us who are making films at the moment, um, because that's a lot of hits. I mean, that's more hits than Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga and... Beyonce put together um, and it's about Play-Doh. Um, the production value, as you can imagine, is fairly basic um, and it scares the hell out of me, to be honest. Um, I think, um, it, yeah, it's sort of, um, so there's no production value um, and um, basically that clip is really big enough to turn um, Surprise Eggs Unboxing Toys channel into a brand itself. I mean, I, 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 there's probably people here who understand more about how YouTube hits um, convert to cash, but I can only imagine um, they've probably made more off that than some feature films. Um, so, I think... The next thing is, um, and this is something that's really come out of working for, um, I've done a bit of work for, well, quite a lot of work for Metallica, and, uh, which is a fantastic gig. Um, and the first thing that they told me when um, we started working was, um, you've got to keep it simple. Please remember that um, our audience are basically truck drivers. Um, if you do things that are complicated, they're not going to understand it. And, and actually, it was a really important point because even though actually Metallica's music is really pretty complicated um, structurally and, and musically, um, the audience, um, and a lot of the audience, actually, it's a, it's a little bit sort of... I don't, I don't know, I think he was being a little bit mean, but... Um, the point is, is that if you do things that are really complicated in live shows, people, it just goes over people's heads. Um, so when we design shows for Metallica, we keep it really simple. So for instance, this song is called Creeping Death, and um, the lyrics are actually about um, <coughs> a biblical massacre, as they are in heavy metal music. And, um, <laughs> So, let's have lots of blood. Um, and th this worked really well. Basically, we had this huge video floor that the band would stand on. And so, what we did was we got somebody to do fluid dynamics and had it so that it looked like loads of blood was being sort of splashed onto the screen um, uh, by this kind of unseen massacre happening around. And... Um, work really well. Nice, easy visual metaphor. Um, for this song one, this song one's about um, people in the First World War, uh, soldiers, and the, the, it kind of comes from a, a film where somebody gets um, their, their limbs blown off, and so we made this piece, which if you can imagine, there were these soldiers and tanks um, 
were all projected on um, these screens that rolled down from the ceiling um, to form this kind of 360 degree um, panorama around the band. Um, and they played in the middle of it. And so there was this nice thing about being able to very clearly see the idea of um, here are these soldiers and then also this nice sort of um, motif of the fact that they just all seem to be sort of walking around in a circle, almost like this kind of uh, this endless sort of loop of, um, of misery. Um, and, uh, and that was, yeah, that was a kind of really, really effective piece. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I guess my next point is... Um, I mean, this really comes from um, anyone who's done any sort of um, film script writing or tried to write anything, really. Um, it's all about finding the conflict. Um, <clears throat> what's the... Uh, that's what, when you're watching a film, effectively, you're almost always watching a scene where two different parties want different things and you're watching which one gets it, to, to put it very simply. Um, and that's what's interesting to watch, is some sort of conflict that, that's happening. And so when I'm sort of working particularly with these guys, it is all about saying, OK, where can we, where can we find that conflict in the song? Um, for this song, um, Cyanide, um, there was a line in it that with Cyanide, I've already died. And so we had this idea. Um, being Metallica, of course, they happen to have 10 coffins suspended in midair above the stage with LED screens <laughs> embedded in them. And the big question was, what the hell do you put on them? And so we thought it would be kind of rude not to have people in the coffins. Um, and so this idea, um, came out of that, of saying, you've got to put people in the coffins. Um, what do they do? They're waking up, and they discover they've been buried alive. So, I've, and, uh, so we got some um, amazing physical performance actors, um, and um, basically they all improvised um, single take shots of um, themselves. We had a, a coffin built. Basically, they all got in, in turn, and did a single seven minute performance of um, what it felt like to wake up inside a coffin and discovered that you'd, you'd been buried alive. Um, so there, obviously the conflict is, I want to get out of the coffin. Um, here they are in situ. Um, just, just, and, so, and to make it a little bit more, um, to sort of add to the conflict, these, these um, coffins are descending as the song goes on. And so um, we um, filmed um, a kind of bed of writhing maggots um, which sat on the, uh, on the video floor underneath them. Um, so it was as if, as if you had these, uh, you could see not only the struggle, but also um, raising the stakes a bit here um, by actually seeing their potential face. Um, this piece we, we did was for, uh, they did a tour where they um, played the Black Album, which is one of their sort of most famous albums. And, um, and this piece came from, um, this was called The God That Failed. And um, in this one, um, basically James Hetfield, the lead singer, his mum uh, was a Christian scientist and she, she basically got a disease and rather than getting treated, she decided that she was uh, going to leave it up to God. And, um, and she died uh, when he was quite young. And that's kind of, I guess, probably why he writes the songs he does. And um, this song seemed to be very much about this idea of, well, the God that failed. And um, so I, somebody had shown me this picture of um, a place in Lithuania called uh, the Hill of the Crosses. And um, it's a huge uh, monument where um, basically lots of people um, come and place um, crucifixes. And they've just sort of piled up over about 80 years. And it's now a sort of, uh, it's a sort of place of pilgrimage. And so the idea of this song was to, it kind of felt, I don't know, I mean, I'm not a Christian, so 
it kind of felt like this huge sort of uh, pile of, uh, of futility. And so I guess what I was trying to do was to, again, sort of show the conflict by having um, this incredibly powerful symbol of people's faith and then the conflict coming from there being somebody in front of it um, singing about the exact opposite. Um, so I guess that's, you know, and that's kind of what I find really interesting about the, the live arena. And particularly, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of really good working for <coughs> bands like Metallica because of the fact that um, you're not doing something that's necessarily, people aren't looking for a nice happy experience necessarily. They're looking for a different kind of thing. So you can suggest things like, why don't we have a shot of um, a soldier having his insides eaten by carrion birds? For instance, and um, and people go, yeah, that's that's that'll probably work quite well, actually. Um, so, and I guess the the other thing that's interesting about Metallica, I was just thinking about the idea of branding, and um, actually working for Metallica, it was really interesting. You had to really go by their brand guidelines, and. Um, as somebody said to me, you've got to realise that there are a lot of people walking around who have this tattooed on their bodies. And if it doesn't look like their tattoo, they're not going to be happy. And so, and it is, it's, it's the thing that I guess is quite a responsibility, particularly when you're working with um, bands like that, is the fact that people have got a lot emotionally invested in, in those um, in those songs and those bands and um, you know it's almost like music uh, particularly if it's music from your past is like kind of taking up emotional real estate inside your head you know you've got all sorts of memories connected with it um, and so part of that is trying to um, not sort of crowd that out with your own conception of what it is, is sort of trying to give people a little bit of room. So interpreting, but not necessarily trying to uh, force things on. And you find out very quickly when you're doing that, because somebody will just look at you and go, nah, and, and that's it. And then it's, and then it's like, okay, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Um, God, I'm on page two. I've only got a few more to go. Um, Oh, the burger van, yes. So this came from a, 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 a quote, well, not a quote, but basically um, doing festivals. Um, and um, the thing about festivals is the burger van here is basically the opposition. When, when you're at a festival, um, sure, you've got the band on stage and lots of things happening, but there's also all these other stimuli around you. You've got sort of you know, you've got a group of people doing something over there, you've got, um, you've got a fairground ride, you've got smells, you've, you know, you're thinking about going to the toilet, the queue's too long, you want a beer, there's all these things going on. And so in that situation, our job is to try and get people to focus on a show um, and to try and take them out of that situation and sort of bring them into... This this uh, this kind of theatrical performance and uh, and um, basically I have worked with uh, a friend of mine Adam Smith um, on the Chemical Brothers show for quite a few years now um, he's worked on it for about 20 years um, and um, and this is you know this is this show basically is designed for festivals and um, and every time we do um, a tour with them, um, it's all about keeping it simple. It's all about saying, let's do one thing, there's one idea. We have a big board that we put up and basically we end up with um, lots and lots of little post-its and, and things to sort of try and map out the arc of the show. Um, but try to use as, as few words as possible and we say, okay, well this song, um, it's called Horsepower, it's about horse. And um, so it's got, a big horse that we, we, we <coughs> found some, uh, some motion capture data of a horse and we got somebody to, uh, these guys realised studio to, to build this 3D model um, 
and, and animated the horse and it was it was one of those things where the idea happened and um, we just happened to find this amazing horse data and it just kind of worked and it was kind of like the song's called Horsepower you got a horse it's sort of I know it sounds a bit but it really is you do kind of have to be that simple um, this song Swoon um, was um, the lyric was um, remember to fall in love and so it became a love story and it was um, and so what we're trying to do is is there's so many things going on there's lights uh, there's the burger van there's the music there's the people dancing around next to you you can't assume that anyone is going to watch a narrative in that situation they're they're just kind of not interested what they want is it's it's basically a lot more like um inventing scenery really and and so that people have got um they're kind of getting what it's all about you're providing the mood the emotion so i'm going to try slipping that in now i've told you i'm talking about emotion tonight um but trying to provide the sort of um to amplify the feeling of the music um but not to play somebody a film that's not that's not what we're there to do um in terms of creating emotion um one of the things i made this piece which i'm just going to sort of run as i talk um is that playing yet no i think i've got a Yes, uh, here we go. So this was an art piece that I made um, in Australia quite a few years ago. And um, basically what we did was to film um, portraits of people in ultra slow motion, um, <laughs> at a thousand frames a second. And the thing that was really interesting about this piece um, is it's all about tension. It's all about watching the moment when it's kind of like, it's coming out, what's going to happen? It's going to hit her, it's going to hit her, it's going to hit her. And, and so there's this tension that builds up and then you get the release. <laughs> and um, so, and this piece, um, was yeah it was it was kind of really popular actually um we, we um this went on show in art in um various sort of I, I i actually kind of became a fine artist because of this piece um i sort of made it um quite light-heartedly and ended up getting it got sort of put into all these really proper fine art exhibitions and i sort of went around giving sort of artist talks even more nervously than I am now and uh, <laughs> and <laughs> trying to explain what it was all about um, so yeah this this kind of launched me along that that path um, the next thing that um, is really really important is sound and um, I'm going to say a big up to the sound guy over here um, the people who do sound in film and video production are probably um, the sort of unsung heroes of, um, of the film business and um, <coughs> everyone wants them to get out of the way of the camera, nobody's got any budget for sound. The truth of it is, is well this is what George Lucas says and this is what Danny Boyle says and <laughs> it's absolutely 100% true. When I've, I've got quite a few friends who are editors um, editing for TV, particularly documentaries, and uh, I think when they started off, it was all about picture, um, and it was all about cutting these pictures together, and now, when I watch them working, they spend loads of time doing the sound, and working out exactly what is being said, and, and crafting the story, and all of that comes from the sound, and then at the end, They've got a whole bunch of shots that are kind of come in because somebody's saying something, so they're sort of already in the, the timeline. And then they kind of paper these other shots over the top, but it's almost um, not an afterthought, but, um, but you start realising that... Um, I mean, there's an old quote that TV is radio with pictures, and you start realising how true that is. Um, and um, so I thought I would show you this. Um, this is a, a piece that I did for um, Adidas, and um, hopefully this is going to play without any sound.
Okay. Now sound guy knows what to do. Blast it a little bit. <laughs> okay, so let's watch this with sound. Okay, so hopefully the point was made. Um, so yes, another big shout and thank you for sorting that out so quickly. Um, and um, so yeah, as, as a producer that I worked with once said, um, music tells you how you're supposed to feel when you're watching a film, and and that's been true since the days of silent cinema. Um, even then, you had a pianist who would be <coughs> playing a musical accompaniment, and and it's. Uh, the thing about music is it's just a sort of completely um, instant tap into a sort of emotional thing that um, I would love to be able to do um, with pictures and we try but that's a lot easier. Um, so what happens then when you start combining the two things together? Um, so this is the next thing is a clip from the the, uh, the Chemical Brothers film that we made, which was uh, this was a, a tour um, uh, that we made uh, a few years back, and uh, we made a film of it called Don't Think, and uh, so we filmed at a Fuji Rock Festival in Japan, and um, so um, this is from a song called Super Flash. Um, so hopefully, yeah, this is again this is about music intention. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, this is, this is kind of um, what you go to a Chemical Brothers show for, is that, um, that thing of tension and release of, of this kind of build-up where everything seems to be sort of heading for this one point and you get there and everything sort of seems to be happening at the same time, this massive climax, and then, bosh, there's this release and this, this moment where you sort of feel sort of a bit like the top of the roller coaster, really. And then... Um, and then it takes you down again and then builds you back up. And that's kind of, I mean, you know, I guess um, this is, uh, <coughs> I, I went to a Skrillex show not that long ago. My God, <laughs> they do this, but sort of every song it seems to happen, like I'm saying like a real old git here, but it seems to happen every sort of <laughs> minute and a half. And you're just like, and you watch these people trying to keep up with it. And they're like, <laughs> it's the drop, it's the drop. And they all sort of, <laughs> mental for about 30 seconds and everyone's out of breath and you see everyone stop and sort of like <laughs> and then that's it and then they sort of wait and it's coming again <laughs> um, <where are> we? <laughs> 
Oh, yes, the, uh, the subconscious mind, the unconscious mind, I should say. Um, so this was, um, I, I did, I, at one point I was doing a lot of reading about, um, about sort of, what was that, some favourite word? Yeah, Um, so, um, so the idea that um, I guess this idea, you know, it's the it's the sort of Freudian Jungian idea that there's all the stuff that's happening on top, and then underneath all of that, there's a whole lot of other stuff happening. And um, and um, I guess um, I was reading a a, a, a lot of book uh, a book by Joseph Campbell um, called Hero of a Thousand Faces, which is a sort of book that a lot of um, script writers read, which is all about storytelling and myth, and it's a little bit sort of, it's probably a little bit old hat now, but some, some really interesting ideas about the fact that there are these kind of um, archetypal figures in a, in a sort of lurking underneath the surface in our minds, and so I was talking to Adam about this, and, um, and um, I was sort of saying, when we started off doing visuals, um, years and years ago, we used to use slide projectors and we, when we very first started off, I had a whole bunch of slides of architectural drawings which um, belonged to my dad. And so I was sort of saying, well, you know, maybe this is it. Well, maybe what I'm doing is, um, is literally sort of projecting my father out into the audience. It's quite interesting, isn't it? And then he was like, um, yeah, well, I'm projecting my father as well, except I've got him made up as a really scary clown. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the scary clown from the Chemical Brothers show, and, uh, which is Adam's dad. Um, Adam's dad loves doing this role um, when he does it. <laughs> and it's, you know, just known as the scary clown. And he says, you are all my children now. And it's one of the best moments in the show where everyone's kind of, yeah. <laughs> then we're all his children now and, um, so we sort of we explored this idea in um, uh, Tom and Ed asked us to um, make visuals for um, the album the album further um, the, the album before this one and um, so we came up with this idea of maybe we should do a kind of abstract journey. I mean, it being visuals, we didn't want to do a sort of straight narrative, but that maybe we could um, we could sort of string the whole thing together as a sort of um, a girl's journey through kind of like a, a trip, really. So um, um, he was um, going out with Ron Garay at the time, and um, who graciously. Um, became the girl in our film, um, uh, he did an amazing job, and, uh, and so that's her, um, diving, into the, uh, diving into the water, so the idea was that um, this is um, kind of diving into the unconscious, and we kind of mined all these, um, <coughs> all these ideas of, of, of myth, and, um, and this, so this is kind of the frog princess jumping into the pond, um, and, uh, and sort of kind of went along with that, that that vibe, um, and this is this is how it got shown at the Roundhouse. Um, so what we did was we we made a kind of audio visual album. So you could buy the album with a DVD, um, and then we played the album with the visuals um, at the Roundhouse. And we did this uh, had the amazing opportunity of uh, of actually showing this kind of whole film on a, a massive screen with uh, with lighting and. Uh, and everything else to accompany it, um, and and this was sort of, um, and this kind of transmuted into the the Don't Think film, which I, I showed a bit of earlier, um, and so we sort of we thought we'd mine this idea again for for this tour, um, and um, if anyone's a fan of Kenneth Anger, I should probably make uh, our apologies for um, appropriating him quite quite directly in this in this clip. Um, and so this, I, this clip is from uh, a track called um, I'll See You There. And um, so the idea was um, to stage a, a kind of Dionysian ritual. Uh, the, the track has a very kind of 60s psychedelic feel. So we, we were sort of looking at that idea of, um, 
of uh, the sort of 60s psychedelic trip, but sort of, um, well, I'll just play it. So this comes about two thirds of the way through uh, the set of the, uh, the current show, and uh, um, there's um, uh, Adam. Strangely, he's actually been um, taking Ed's part on stage as the uh, as a chemical brother because Ed's off been doing a, a degree, and so he was he's been on stage for a lot of this tour, and um, and they played um, Electric Zoo in New York. Uh, quite recently, and um, and um, it was like um, Tom was sort of going, nobody's dancing, and um, afterwards it was like, you know, sort of going, nobody's dancing, and uh, Errol, who works on, was like, they were all really freaked out by that, <laughs> <laughs> and and that was sort of the idea that you've got this, um, you've got this kind of, you know, hey, it's a it's an EDM show, everyone, and then this happens in the middle, and everyone's a bit like. It's a bit wrong, isn't it? Um, and, and in fact, the guy who, uh, whose film we based this on quite loosely um, was, um, well, a sort of pioneer of um, queer cinema and, um, and a Satanist as well, to boot, um, which I've, we haven't told them, so don't watch this, guys. Um, and it does have, uh, it, the, the, I guess it's that thing of... Um, the idea of the original film was very much it was all these kind of um, kind of mythical figures in this in this ritual, and it sort of reminded me of that idea of like um, the sort of dance or sort of conflicts between these kind of unconscious characters inside your head. So it, I guess what I'm saying is that we've found a, a lot of power from using stuff that isn't about stuff on the surface. It's that stuff that's uh, that's lurking underneath. Um, and uh, yeah, so this talk to the inner child. Well, I guess yeah. The thing about the emotional um, the thing about emotion is that really it's a very much uh, in sort of psychological terms. It is about um, the sort of child understanding of things. It's not about um, a sort of adult intellectual approach to things. It's about how you react to that, I guess what you call, what some people would call the id, um, the inner child, the, uh, the, that sort of uh, child inside you that, um, that um, isn't interested in how it works there, um, is interested in how it works here, and um, which kind of, kind of goes back to the unboxing video. You know, it's the ugliest video imaginable, but what it gives a child, especially, is that feeling of opening up a present on Christmas Day, what that feels like. And um, I think that's why it's got 650 million hits. It's because it's, it's a feeling, isn't it? And what better feeling than that feeling? Of, and somehow, these idiots have captured it and <laughs> probably made a fortune. Probably more than we're all over making a lifetime. Um, so I guess my point here is that um, Talking to the inner child is a good thing. Um, we made this piece to launch a, uh, a Nokia phone, and uh, we got the amazing opportunity to um, take over a, a square in London. And it was a bit like, I guess, because I grew up with sort of warehouse parties and sort of uh, doing things in abandoned buildings and that kind of very urban thing that London is sort of stopping being really now. And uh, and so. We, um, we were asked to come up with a follow-up to a, a really epic um, projection job where Nokia sort of projected on Millbank Tower and this massive thing happened. Um, and so my thing was, well, maybe we can 
turn somewhere quite normal into somewhere quite amazing. And so um, uh, we had this idea of maybe we could make this square come to life. And uh, they, um, so they got um, Dead Mouse back and we made this, I'll show you a really short clip from it. So, so that piece, if you can imagine, this took um, this took months, and I mean, it was one of those things where we sat in council meetings trying to persuade people to, you know, let us close the roads. We had to convince community groups. We, um, you know, highways and safety departments. We um, we had to close the square for a week to to do it. It was it was kind of this enormous budget, and um, and um, it was lots and lots of fun. I learned lots about um, doing shows, most of it because some things really didn't work, um, but enough of it did work to make it really quite quite popular. Um, um, what do people remember from it? The bins. <laughs> Everyone loved the bins. It was like, that was the thing we did with the light out wheelie bins, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> And again, it's like it was kind of like this stupid sort of childlike idea. We'll have the bins light up, and um, in fact, we had all sorts of things in the square. We had motorcycle headlights and um, traffic cones and um, flower arrangement, all sorts of things. Um, but for some reason, the bins—that that was the thing that stuck. Um, so, sort of on that um, idea of. Um, talking to the inner child, um, we um, were talking, Adam and I were discussing how we would make this new Chemical Brothers tour different from the last one. And, and the idea was, let's try and bring the visuals to life. Let's try and really integrate the lighting, the staging, and the visuals together so there's much more of a kind of uh, flow. Wherever possible, try and, um, try and make them um, come to life and so we were going through the visuals we had and sort of going what would what would work and then it was like well you know well you know what about we could have the robots why don't we um and it was like that's it you know what about some giant robots and um and then it was like oh you know it'd be quite a number though you got taken by plane everywhere so we spoke to james who's the uh the production manager who's the person who actually has to kind of make this work and um he was kind of like, right, giant robots. And he was kind of like, can we have lasers coming out of their eyes? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So I think, you know, and again, what you get from that is this sort of, at that moment in the show, you, you, if you've been to a few Chemical Brothers shows, you get that there's going to be lots of visuals and sort of, you know, lighting and all the rest of it. And then this happens and it feels like a, it's, it sort of transforms the, the situation because 
I guess part of it is it's a bit like, wow, they've really been bothered to bring those bloody things with them. <laughs> and, and, and people love them. And I can remember when the... Um, and, you know, they took ages to, to, you know, if you can imagine, you know, there's a guy who's in Birmingham who builds all of sort of Iron Maiden stuff, and he was the guy who, who Dave um, at Specials, who, who, um, who built them for us. Um, you know, there's like, you know, getting the lasers right and the video screens, you know, all the huge, like, months of prep to make this work. Um, and they turned up at um, production rehearsals, which happen basically, I think we were doing them at uh, Elstree Film Studios. And, um, and there's all the local crew who sort of um, unload everything and put it up. And when they arrived, it was like all work stopped. Um, and everyone was like, robots, yeah. <laughs> and, and literally, wherever, um, wherever they turn up at festivals, um, people, uh, all the local crew are just like, everyone's posing and taking pictures. And, and um, so it felt like, yes, we've got this right. We've, we're, so I was quite pleased with that. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, so it, it was a real thing of sort of going, this is, and this is, I guess, it's, a, it's almost a kind of unique opportunity with the, with the Chemical Brothers because they, um, they're in this situation where they want stuff like this. You know, not every client um, <laughs> wants huge robots. And, um, <laughs> and so it feels like an enormous privilege to be in a position where you can actually suggest stuff quite that stupid. And everyone go, yeah. We'll spend a lot of money on that. The people are going to love it. And um, so um, I thought I would, just moving on from that, um, uh, this idea of um, letting the audience complete the circle. And, and what I mean by that, um, well, maybe I'll show you this clip. That might be a good, a good way of doing it. <laughs> And I guess the point here is that what people really liked, the advertising people really liked, was that you got the punchline in someone else's time. You were sort of, you'd watch their ad and then you put it together while someone else's ad is running. That was brilliant. And um, the, the whole thing of this was it was like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to give you like 90% of this, but then as the audience, you're going to put that last piece in. Um, and I guess what it does is it kind of makes you um, feel like you own it. Um, it's, not just, it's not just sort of uh, your thing. Um, it's not just their thing. It's yours. Um, I, I love this poster for Sensation from, from years and years ago um, for that same reason. It's basically two fairly ordinary pictures. Um, but it's where the pictures join, you put it together, you feel the sensation. And it just felt like it was a, it was a, a really nice bit of design in terms of, um, in terms of it works almost in the same way that, um, that uh, film montage works of um, here's one shot, here's another shot. And what you do when it goes from one to the other is you make a third shot inside your head, which um, like here, you don't get, you're not seeing the tongue burning, but you feel it from seeing the two images put together. Um, and I thought I'd show you a clip from um, this um, documentary um, called uh, Century of the Self, um, which is uh, a documentary by Adam Curtis. And this is about the, um, uh, the influence of... Um, Psycho, were well basically psychoanalysis and Freud on advertising. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen this, it's an absolutely sort of um, brain popping documentary. Um, it's really worth watching. And um, and this piece is um, it's talking about. Um, well, I'll, again, I'll just play it. Victor's breakthrough came with a focus group study he did for Betty Crocker Foods. Like many food manufacturers in the early 50s, they had invented a new range of instant convenience foods. 
Although consumers have told market researchers they would welcome the idea, in fact, they were refusing to buy them. The worst problem was the Betty Crocker cake mix. Dicta did a series of focus groups where housewives free associated about the cake mix. He concluded that they felt unconscious guilt at the new image being promoted of ease and convenience. In other words, he understood that the barrier to the consumption of the product was the housewife's feeling of guilt about using it. They basically, on one hand, wanted to make it easy for themselves, but they felt guilty about it. So what you've got to do in those circumstances is remove the barrier, the barrier being guilt. The way you do that is to give the housewife a greater sense of participation. And how do you do that? By adding an egg. <laughs> Dicta told Betty Crocker to put an instruction on the packet that the housewife should add an egg. It would be an unconscious symbol, he said, of the housewife mixing in her own eggs as a gift to her husband, and so would lessen the guilt. Betty Crocker did it, and the sales saw. And I think I've got to apologise to all the women in the audience for picking that particular <laughs> clip out as an example. But um, again, it's that thing about completing the circle, about the idea that if you um, give people a sort of space and to, to sort of make it their own, then um, they feel ownership over it. Um, and in fact... Um, my wife was making some brownies the other day and the Betty Crocker brownie mix still has an instruction to add an egg. Um, and so uh, quite a lot of the work, I'm not going to show any more Bon Jovi, but um, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the work that I do now has involved um, user-generated content. So um, the, the thing of basically setting up some sort of situation where people can um, participate in um, in sort of uh, promotion. I mean, for this this particular piece was uh, for uh, living on a prayer. And what what we noticed was at the end of the Bon Jovi concert when he played Living on a Prayer. Um, basically, he didn't really even have to sing it. He kind of played the first two notes and just go. <laughs> and everyone, and this was kind of like you can imagine. This is like the big moment in the show, and um, and so we noticed in the choruses you couldn't hear the band at all. It was just people singing, and um, so um, they asked us to um, basically come up with a user-generated campaign, um, basically to drive people to their online fan club, and um, so we came up with the idea of um, using the uh, the chorus to "Living on a Prayer." Uh, on your webcam, submit it, um, we'll stick it up on the screen and the best, um, the best entries will um, get shown. Um, the best entry will, um, you'll be singing next to John Bon Jovi at the concert, we'll give you some tickets. Um, people love this. There was one guy, I, I haven't got the clip here, who sort of did the most amazing sort of um, clip of him sort of freaking out at, a, at some sort of at some sort of sporting event and uh, which went viral as well and it was and so and the thing was it was but it was a genuinely great communal moment there was all these people sort of at the concert all feeling it together and then there are all these other people from around the world all joining in and it was like again sort of taking this thing to the to the next level um, and uh, since then I've done some other projects um, with uh, a company called Rumpus Room, uh, run by a friend of mine, Tom Rook, and uh, who specialise in doing these kind of um, crowdsourced videos, um, and it's it's really effective because of the fact that um, you feel like you're you're participating in something. In fact, it's a bit more complicated than that because it's like you're doing something, but we're kind of setting all the rules, so you're participating, but not necessarily completely the author of the work and so there's this there's this there's this very fine balance between getting people to participate where if you ask them to go and make a whole film you probably won't get that many people if you get them to hit like on facebook 
you probably get a lot of people, but it doesn't really mean anything. So it's trying to find that sort of very delicate balance of what is it that where people will actually go out of their way to do something um, and, uh, and, and make something for you. Um, and so this kind of started informing what I was trying to do in art as well. God, I've been talking for 55 minutes, geez. Um, so um, I made this piece um, called House of Pain, which was a commission for um, uh, Merge Festival, which is um, uh, basically sponsored by uh, Better Bankside and uh, the Tate Modern. So it's all the sort of surroundings around the, uh, around the Tate. And uh, so we made this piece. And what it was, was um, you basically went into um, a building and um, we invited you to scream. And basically, you're in this black room, and when you scream, we built this bit of software that would analyze your scream, and in real time, it would light up the room and also the outside of the building. So. <laughs> So this piece, we had 4,000 people come in and scream over about a month. Um, we had some people who came back and screamed every day. And <laughs> well, I, you're, you're providing a really useful sort of social function here. Um, and um, and it, was, it was really popular. It was like, um, it got a lot of, um, and people, when I was, I was back there doing another piece, which I'll also show you, um, recently, oh yeah, yeah, the screaming. Yeah, great, great. And again, it was that, so, it was that sort of thing of um, catharsis, this feeling of being able to to release, but also the idea that it's on such a big scale, it's kind of all about amplifying. And I, I guess that's what people are really into at the moment, is this idea of being able to amplify themselves. And, you know, we see it obviously all the time in social media. And again, it's that thing of trying to find the right balance where um, a scream is kind of, it's your scream, but it's also not too dissimilar from other people's screams. It's not something that's easy to get wrong. Um, <coughs> so people felt actually quite comfortable doing it. And once they'd seen that other people were doing it, this social proof effect come kind of kicks in, which is like the, you know, if, you, if all your friends jumps off a cliff, would you do it? And the answer seems to be yes, probably. Um, <laughs> and, and people, as soon as they saw that, it was, it was like, all right, I'll have a go at that. It looks all right. And um, so, um, yeah, so this was, yeah, kind of really, really popular. And, and again, sort of um, taught me a lot about, um, I guess, what people are prepared to do. It's kind of risk and reward, I guess. Um, so, yeah, this um, valuing emotional honesty. Well, I mean, I guess my thing here is that if you look at what um, what people um, people who are making a lot of money these days, think about songwriters and actors and um, to the very few who are um, politicians, um, emotionally honest. Those people um, people love them because of the fact that if they're being genuinely open about how they feel about things they're kind of saying it for the rest of us um, and so it's a really powerful thing but also it's something where I think you've got to be you've got to be very careful as well because it's not you know it's it's uh, it's powerful stuff um, back to Bon Jovi again um, so we made this piece which was called um, we weren't born to follow and this sort of happened around about the time that Obama was happening and you can probably see a sort of Shepherd Fairy didn't sue, but probably should have done. Um, and we sort of had this idea of um, basically using these sort of slightly, um, how can I put it, um, vague but inspiring words, slogans, and these inspirational figures um, to illustrate the theme of the song, which was kind of taken from the video. And it was all about sort of, we weren't born to follow I can't remember the lyrics, but uh, something along the lines of, um, 
you've got to stand up for what you believe, you've got to sort of, you know, hold strong. So there was images of, um, of uh, Muhammad Ali, basically inspirational people. Um, and um, it was the opening song in the show, and it was, yeah, everyone sort of had this, like, yeah, you've got to stand up. And I think standing up's a big thing in Bon Jovi things. Um, <laughs> he likes making people stand up. So um, I saw this recently. Um, and um, <laughs> so, yeah, as you can probably read, we did actually use an image of... Dalai Lama, because we're kind of coming up, you know, riffing. Who are, who can you think of who are like sort of figures um, with that you can't mess about with? That it's like, you know, you put them up there. Who's going to argue with Desmond Tutu? You can't argue with Desmond Tutu, can you? He's, um, but there's actually surprisingly few people um, who who kind of are these kind of genuine heroes who just don't have anything wrong with them. And in fact, um, in you'll see. Um, over next to that straight thing, there's a picture of Lance Armstrong, who obviously had to come out when uh, he was discovered for the drugs cheating. Um, and um, so Bon Jovi toured, we're going to tour China, and um, the Chinese authorities saw this picture of the Dalai Lama and were like, well, you're not bloody touring here, mate. Um, <laughs> And almost, you kind of think, well, quite rightly, because it's like, here you've got John Bon Jovi talking about this stuff, and we had shots of, you know, the guys standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, um, and saying, this is what I believe in. And then, you go and tour China, who are obviously, the two things aren't really compatible. And for me, it was kind of, I, my first thought was, you know, um, well, the Chinese government aren't necessarily wrong on this one. Um, you know, if you are going to say this is what it's all about, you've got to kind of stick to your guns. Um, so the next thing was kind of going back to that thing of um, of um, learning from the art installations is that um, if you've got an audience, generally they really want to, um, they're there to, like a film, to suspend disbelief. You, they, they don't want you to fail. Um, uh, it's kind of what they say before uh, best man speeches, isn't it? And, um, so, um, so people come sort of thinking, yeah, I, I want this to be to work. And we made, uh, well, I made this piece, um, which is called On Your Wavelength. And the idea of this was to, um, to um, you, you could control a laser and sound composition using your mind. And it, genuinely works you know we sort of spent quite a lot of time doing the software and you put this sensor on well I'll show you um, and what, what I've done is cut this with some um, some sort of reactions from the people who saw it I'm scared. Um, it, it, it feels like it's sucking you in. 
I wasn't getting much reaction from it, so I decided to focus on something that's just a bit powerful and profound in my life. And then it started moving a lot more and the sounds, the sounds reflected. I was feeling uh, really significant. Yeah, it was like powerful and positive. <laughs> I just, I don't think I've ever, ever done anything quite like it. It's amazing. You lost yourself in there. Uh, you just blanked your mind and just spoke with it. It's definitely the best thing I've seen this year. Amazing. I love the colours changing and the line sizes getting thicker and thinner. It's really magical. It's, I'm a bit lost for words. So obviously I've cut the good comments in there. Um, <laughs> but people really had a strong sort of emotional reaction to it. And I mean, part of it was the fact that it was a quite an intense experience in that we took one of the lasers that normally are used at like Glastonbury and made a kind of one person laser show. So you, this thing you'd normally see from sort of, you know, the other side of the field was kind of almost, you know, just at the end of the tunnel. and. Um, um, but people really read a lot into it, and um, one of the things was the colour. Um, people really felt that, you know, yeah, that's, that colour is exactly sort of how, I'm, how I was feeling. And, um, and the thing was, was that I guess once people um, had this headset on and they felt like they were controlling it, it didn't feel like they were just controlling one element, it felt like they were controlling the whole thing. And, and they were really only kind of controlling part of it and in fact the colour kind of we did a bit of scanning but um, their sort of brain waves to assign them something it wasn't, wasn't scientific at all and um, and but once people started saying you know yeah that was it was kind of almost like it wasn't just that you didn't want to not tell them they wouldn't even believe you they would go no no it was definitely red I was definitely <laughs> feeling the red and and, and, you know, we, the instruction that we gave people was to, um, was to concentrate on one thing. Um, and, um, and that's how it works. It basically works on concentration, just sort of um, trying to think of one sort of... And, and so I was like, I thought of... I was finding, thinking of C-3PO worked really well for some reason. Somebody else said Dobby from um, <laughs> Harry Potter was kind of doing it. And then... And, one guy, you know, one of the, uh, the people looking after it sort of said, oh, you know, so what were you thinking of to this guy? And he said, I was thinking about my dead wife. And um, at that moment, you sort of think, uh, I don't know, people are investing this thing with um, a lot more maybe than you might have intended. And I think that's true of a lot of um, experiences, particularly when you're working with um, live music, is that um, these are really sort of meaningful experiences for people so um, I guess the point is is that not to sort of um, abuse that because you know um, it's not it's 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 a sort of it's a technique but it's also it's a real thing um, and so at the end of every Chemical Brothers show there's always this thing that comes up which says um, love is all and um, and that's very much the sort of theme of the show is, you know, there's been this ride, but the message that we're trying to take home from it is um, love is all. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's the end.
Well, it's over to you guys. Um, I don't know about you, uh, this is really quite inspiring what Marcus was talking about. I certainly have quite a few questions, but I, I suspect uh, you do too. So, uh, anyone familiar with this? The catch box. It is a, a phone cue. Um, it has got a microphone inside. Um, it won't hurt you if it, if it lands on you. Um, so it's your opportunity to, uh, to ask a question. And uh, just uh, you know, let me know and I will not the cue at you. Marcus, uh, nice. how did you go from Art Project to uh, Chemical Brothers, uh, Natalia, is the, the leap? Um, well, it's not really, um, <laughs> it's not real sort of. How, how, how did you get the first big gig? You've got lots of big gigs now. But uh, but getting the first big gig yeah. um, was, I guess I was working, um, doing, uh, was probably for you too, that was my first big show, kind of quite a big show, but doing quite a small part on it. And um, again, it kind of came from doing these, um, doing these sort of projection shows at raves. Um, you know, at the time, um, they, the people um, who designed you to show would go out and find, you know, oh, I've got to find all these really hot, young, sort of, arty types. And um, what you two do, and still kind of do now, is they, they just get loads of people to make kind of cool stuff, and then it's really heavily curated. Um, and so they pick stuff, and and so um, I sort of, that was, I guess, was one of my first big shows. Um, and, um, and yeah, so from doing that, I guess that gave me the experience to start pitching and working on okay. some of these other big shows. Anyone else for the catch box? Yeah, the back, can you move uh, it behind you? Yes, there you go, brilliant. Um, with the uh, interactive project where you get have to get people involved with it, how much encouragement do people need? Is it quite instant or do you <laughs> need it? It's, it's amazing. I mean, I think part of it is that, um, is that if people are, are, are there, Generally, they've heard about it, um, and so there's already they've already been primed. And so, for instance, with the on your wavelength thing, you were only really there if you'd heard of it. And um, and so everyone sort of it, that's what was kind of great is that um, everyone was like, right, come on, my go. Um, <laughs> we had cues, you know. Um, I think actually, if you get the balance right, you can get people will people are looking for stuff like this, you know. When you look at um, Punch Drunk Theatre and You Me Bum on Train and Secret Cinema, people are really actually really into this sort of active participation. So, um, yeah, uh, which I think is fantastic. Anyone else for the catch up at the front? Can we have it back at the front? There we go. And also after that, is there anyone next door? Oops, well done. Go on. Hi, Marcus. Uh, amazing talk. Um, I'm a massive metalhead myself, so Metallica <laughs> stuff. I was actually one of, at one of those gigs right, with the coffins. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, I guess my question was actually the same question as the guy behind me, but I've got a different question now. Do you actually um, talk to the bands themselves? Do you show any of the work before it actually go before they actually get on stage? So did you talk to Metallica themselves, or is it all through like the production director? It's, it's, it kind of depends. I mean, um, with Metallica. As you can imagine, it's kind of um, it's fairly mediated. Um, so they've got a, a production designer that um, we present. In, in fact, that thing was I mean that was the most bonkers show I've, I've yeah. worked on. I think the um, bonkers show I've ever seen. It, it was and and basically with that, I mean it's, it seems to be on, like on a mission to burn cash. They sort of um, they said right, come up with some ideas, and so we we put a kind of you know, like a deck together of all these different ideas and um, and showed it to them and sent it off and didn't hear anything for for months um, right. or for a month or something and then we were like, so uh, do you want us to do any of these <laughs> ideas? And then the call was like, oh yeah, 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 no, we want you to do that, yeah, yeah. And we were like, well, which ideas do you want? And they're like, well, I'll just make all of them. <laughs> and it was like... Really? You're like, well, you might as well. And, um, <laughs> and it was like, that's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. And they were like, that's all right. And, um, <laughs> and so we started, we were like, we put the budget together. It was absolutely absurd. And we um, then started making it. And then we got a call saying, okay, stop what you're doing. 
And they were like, hey, what, what you mean like all the product? Yeah, 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 just stop it right now. We're going to put it on hold. And uh, so then um, yeah. we were like, that's going to cost a lot of money. That's right. Just tell us how much it is. Then we waited for a year. Oh and then they started God. up again. And then we made it. And, um, oh. and, um, and there is some contact. Um, but uh, to be honest, they look at it. Um, and if they don't like stuff, they'll tell you. But at the same time, a lot of this stuff, um, what I probably should have said is, is, is these shows, I mean, you get to them and you sort of think, yeah, it's going to work. And then you get there and it's a lot of the Bon Jovi thing. You're like, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Mm. You look at it and you, you imagine it's going to work. And obviously, we get hired because a lot of it does work. But there's some things that you think would be brilliant. It's just like, no. Nah. And nobody has a problem with just going, nobody has a go. They just go, just, just, bit of shit isn't it so let's get rid of it and do something else and like we made this amazing piece with like these girls sort of um swimming under well, another sort of underwater piece you know filmed in pinewood cost sort of tens of thousands um and uh and for what was the song for uh fade to black and it was like oh, yeah. this sort of idea of uh of drowning and um and so we had this piece and beautifully filmed and then it was like oh yeah that's where the statue falls down and um so you won't see anything so there's bits of statue all over the stuff yeah, yeah, that, yeah. the, that obscure the picture so it was just kind of like well it's good but it's not as good as the statue falling over so well, it's a quite yeah. iconic isn't the statue falling over well, <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> yes, currently again like the simple things like what you were saying before it's the simple things that you don't realize yeah, you know yeah and all of these things have huge resonance <coughs> for if you're a metalhead you go it's the fucking statue yeah, exactly. and that's what's important yeah um, sorry. Do, do anyone next door have a question? I'm conscious that I can't, uh, I can't throw it next door. Oh, I'm sure we can. <laughs> Any questions next door? No. No, there's one at the back there. You have to lob it back. Next door, if you do have a question, sorry. please <laughs> shout loudly. That was a bad throw. Sorry. About that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think. Uh, first of all, I think. Um, the, the sort of duration of that applause kind of lets you know how inspiration um, that whole talk was. Usually we're going like three seconds, like, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, and also, where was doing the and 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 um, Twitter account? I see. Mm -hmm. Where that? Yeah, that's yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, but my question is um, from, um, from conception to production to execution. Like, what is your general approach? Obviously, every project and every case is different, but you know, you've been doing this for some time now, so you kind of, um, I also have like a like a general way I mean, that you approach um, your it, work. And it's it's really very similar to film production. Um, so um, generally, what we do, I mean, it's it's very much like in, like making a music video or a or a TV commercial in that um, you kind of come up with. Um, the initial concepts um, really it all comes from the lyrics again because I mean that's for, for doing stuff with with bands um, most of it comes from the lyrics is you try and find some sort of um, some sort of meaning in the song um, and again try and find the conflict kind of try and find the thing that it's the kind of essence of it and then say well how can we show that how can we sort of bring that out and amplify it and make it into um, something and then we kick those ideas around a lot and then um, and then come up with some pictures, and um, and then it kind of kind of goes into normal film production mode of storyboards and uh, mood boards and that sort of thing. Um, and then um, people go, yeah, okay, that that idea works. We like that. Move into production. Generally, I mean, I guess, I guess what's sort of different about the Chemical Brothers show and, and possibly my work on other things as well is that with a lot of tours, a lot of people are just using motion graphics. And my thing is, is that although they can be really amazing, um, there's something, you know, it's rock and roll, it's live. It needs to have that texture. It needs to have that kind of um, analog feel to it because it's a kind of live, a live thing. And um, so I really like using shoots where possible. Um, because of the fact that you can you can capture life, you know, and um, and so what we try and do is do more of that and a bit less uh, post production, 
if you like. But um, I mean, I come from a, a heavy post-production background, so uh, that doesn't always happen. It always it gets complicated. So it's quite a long-winded answer, but <laughs> that's kind of the process. That's all right. Oh, and then a lot of on when we get there, you know, you get there and sort of, as I say, suddenly it's like, it doesn't quite work, does it? Maybe we need to, and then you kind of, it's a bit like fitting a suit, you know, you start going, that image is a bit small for the screen. We need to go into that bit and sort of make that bit bigger and that colour's wrong and sort of try and um, work it into, to sort of take it out of being a sort of video clip and making it into this piece of, part of a piece of theatre. Don't, 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 don't you need don't the box? Right. Right. Let's see how good you fry. Go on. Oh, yeah. Joe! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's when you get a six-foot man frying. <laughs> so, I do know the answer to this one, Marcus, but I thought it was such an interesting conversation that we had. And when you're working on something, how much do you actually write? Oh, uh, lots. I mean, I spent, I'm doing a, a, a submission, I'm doing a Welcome Trust application at the moment. They seem to be one of the only sources of money for arts projects in this country at the moment. And uh, I've spent the last two weeks writing, basically, trying to uh, get the um, get the idea down and honed. And like you know, there's this thing. I've got a real thing about mood boards. Actually, I bloody hate them because of the fact that um, it kind of encourages this thing where. It's kind of like, yeah, well, it's a bit of this and it's a bit of that. And there was some, I was going to talk about that a bit, but I didn't. Um, is that it kind of encourages this kind of um, pick and mix approach and where you're just thinking about what the thing's going to look like at the end rather than what is the actual reason that you're doing this. And, um, and for me, that's the interesting bit is trying to sort of go, why am I doing this and what does that mean to me? And... And what are my motivations for doing it in that way? And then sort of, I don't know, finding the pictures from there. Yeah, I found that hugely inspirational when you told me that. I think making stuff like images, most people do. Just writing when you said that was a shock. And it was good. It was a real eye opener. Uh, anyone else with any questions? Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. You're going to see my throwing now, which isn't very good. Good luck. <laughs> Hi, um, really good presentation, thank you. Um, when you've got such an open kind of brief, say from Metallica, where you kind of just got the lyrics, how do you refine your ideas and kind of pick which ones you should actually go through with? Um, that's a good question, actually. You know, I think on that on that last thing, it was almost the opposite. How the hell are you going to come up with 20 bloody good ideas? Um, and uh, I'm not sure we did come up with 20. We probably came up with about six good ideas in that show, and the rest were, were quite good ideas. Um, and uh, so um, I think sometimes there are some, you know, like everyone, I've got a kind of sketchbook of things. So there's often a bit of a backlog of things that I would like to do, but um, haven't. Um, and so you know, every time a project comes in, it's kind of like go through the sketchbooks and sort of, you know, do that. But again, I think it, it's, in fact, again, you know, um, going back to John Bon Jovi, his thing is, um, his one sort of um, sentence that he uses, or his one question to sort of define the show is, what has that got to do with my music? And that's, that's totally what it's all about. It's like, does this idea, really actually illustrate what the music's about because if it isn't um it's not going to go on stage and and so that generally is the is the thing is does the idea what is it that you know what's the essence of the song what's the essence of the idea and does everything that you're doing point towards that essence or not and if it doesn't it gets the boot Interesting. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any more questions? Yes. Yeah, one more. Can you? Good job. Um, thank you very much for this talk. First of all, that was amazing. A big fan, especially of the interaction elements that you developed at the end, the screams and uh, the mental waves. 
Have you ever tried to develop that with within live events, such as concerts, you know, like um, uh, bouncing the movement and the sound of the crowd on screen? Well, the, the, it's, it's really difficult. That, and the reason for that is because it's very difficult to tell that it's happening. And particularly, and the reason why all of those things are basically one-on-one -on -one interactions is because um, it's really, basically, what happens is that um, if you've got loads and loads of people doing something, you might as well just play a clip and tell people that it's, you're doing it live, you know, because there's no discernible difference. And, and this, is, this is one of the things is that you, you realise that you can say it and go, hey, everyone, you're making this happen. But most of the time, all of those things, they're an absolute nightmare to actually pull off. And nobody knows the difference. And so you're better off just getting somebody to say, if you clap really loudly, it will go red. And, and then just get somebody to do that. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of brutal reality of it. Um, and I wish you could, because we, we get asked to do it all the time. And I just, I just don't know that there's a way of doing it, because of the fact that there's so much visual noise going on. How do you pick out? your interaction. That's the thing that's really difficult. Um, we've never solved it. I didn't mean individual interactions. I meant the crowd for quite interaction. You know, like sometimes you see the crowd from a very, very large crowd. Yeah. From very high up in the sky and suddenly you know, like everybody wants bouncing on their own. It looks like a wave, a nice wave. Can you not make anything with that? Well, there's, there isn't. There's some nice, you know, there's like, um, I think, you know, Coldplay did it with the, the wristbands, that sort of idea of actually um, that um, at a certain point in the song, everyone was where it was given a wristband. Well, I think they, people bought them, in fact, and then, you know, suddenly all the wristbands lit up and everyone did this. And there was, and it was great. It was a fantastic idea because what happened was at that moment, everyone was linked. Everyone had their one, they watched everyone else's light up and this thing happened all around them. So it kind of shifted the focus of the, uh, of the show from being there to being here and sort of seeing all these people around you sort of, wow, look. And that little, again, childlike wonder, oh, look, it's lit up and it's doing pretty colours. And, and then this big communal thing about everyone sort of, um, everyone putting their hands up and having this shared experience. And, and it was a really, really powerful idea. And... Um, and a really good idea and and there's been this you know lots of people have tried to do kind of the same thing but um by you know well maybe we can make big shapes and sort of you know you kind of saw it at the olympics they sort of tried to do it and but actually it kind of for me misses the point the the point is about that communal moment and that's that's where the charge is is that thing of going yeah look mine's lit up individually now we're all together. That's the kind of the important, um, the, what's got the emotional charge in it. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, th thank you ever so much. Thank you uh, to Anne and Anne for Creative Corner. You can see the little hashtag up there. But a really, really massive thank you to uh, Marcus Lyle. Um, that was uh, absolutely brilliant. And, and also the most important people here, which is you folks here asking the questions and, and making this event for what it is. Um, thank you to Tilly at the back. I don't know if you can see, she's done a sterling job of illustrating tonight. Give us a wave, Tilly. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly embarrassing for you there. Okay. Um, big thank you to the proud archivist. It's a, 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 bit, a bit of a sweaty venue for us this evening. It's a, a fantastic venue. Um, we've had our goodie bags filled by a number of people. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head. I've had a frantic day. But it's Handsome Frank, Moo and Proper Corn. Did you enjoy that? Yep. Quite nice corn, wasn't it? Um, Cashbox. Um, even us rubbish people at throwing managed to pass it, which was, which was excellent. Um, London Sounds, thank you very much. You've uh, met and exceeded our expectations today, so thank you. Um, <laughs> um, Emote Media for uh, their filming and Shoreditch Hype, um, so thank you. Um, oh, hang on. That's all their logos. Oh, that's all their logos. Sorry, I was meant to show that earlier. As you can see, I'm a very interactive person myself. Um, I've just got a couple more things to say, uh, and then you can go and buy a much-deserved beer, I think. 
Um, basically, this conversation doesn't stop here. This is going to continue. Um, there's big plans for Creative Corner in 2016. It's going to be more disruptive, more themes that are, you know, uh, current, um, and they're going to publish more. Um, you can join in a number of ways. Um, we've got the uh, Instagram uh, and 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 limited, uh, or obviously on Twitter at and 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 limited. You saw that earlier. If you go to the uh, website for andandand.co.uk, you can sign up to a newsletter, which is quite nice. Um, there's a few of us with these badges. Can you see these pink and black badges? We are what's termed the Creative Corner family, so please feel free to speak to any of us this evening to find out how you can get involved. Um, Creative Corner is actively looking for people to join illustrators, filmmakers, designers, writers. Basically, with, with your help, Creative Corner will get bigger and better. So the biggest thank you goes to all of you here this evening. So thank you very much. Um, If you want a beer, the bar is open. That's where we're going to be. So hopefully we can get to speak to as many of you as possible this evening. And you know what? There's a load of people here. Maybe we should all try and talk to someone we don't know uh, and make some really great creative con connections. So thank you very much.